Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, the June 2021 uh, meeting of the Naperville Astronomical Association. Uh, I'm Jim Irwin. I'm the, the new president of the NAA. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, just a few notes before we uh, before we proceed with our speaker. Um, we have some upcoming events. Uh, on Tuesday, June 15th is our Astronomy Fundamentals program. Uh, that'll be done by Chris Almanza and it'll be uh, astrophoto astrophotography simplified. So he's gonna show some pre and post processing. So he's, he's gonna try to make it a, a pretty easy program to follow. Um, astrophotography can get pretty, uh, pretty muddy and he's gonna do his best to, to make that uh, a simple show for us. And then uh, next month, our meeting is on July 6th. Uh, we do not have the uh, topic of what the speaker is going to be talking about yet, but pay attention to our our calendar, and and you'll uh, you'll get to see that uh, once it's available. It'll be in the newsletter too. Um, for all of our events, you can you can go to our calendar, which is at uh, neighborastro.org/calendar. Uh, we do have some pop-up events periodically, and we'll post those on Facebook or on our members message board uh, if we do those. And then uh, if you're not watching this live, um, or if you wanna watch any of our other events, you can you can uh, check out our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash neighborastro. Uh, click that subscribe button and, and follow us, and you'll you'll see whenever we post new events. All of our uh, all of our programs we're we're adding to our YouTube channel, and we plan on continuing to add those after we go back to uh, in person meetings. Um, so this evening, if you want to ask a question, you can do that on Facebook in the comments section, or if you're watching from our website, you can email questions at neighborastro.org, and we'll try to feed those questions into Mark as he's as he's going along. Uh, so this evening, our, our speaker will be Mark Christensen. Uh, he's a lifelong astronomy enthusiast, and he has a background. He has a vast background in, in just everything you can imagine, but the, the five-word version is he has a, a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics and a PhD in Mathematics. And uh, he's gonna be talking to us about the, the high school mathematics and physics behind dark matter. And Mark, if you're there, I will turn this over to you. Okay, well, Jim, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I've been involved in, in astronomy since the early 1960s, which means I can go back to the days when we all used to grind our own mirrors. And if you could get a clock drive on your telescope, it was a miracle. Uh, so by comparison, thanks to the uh, improvements in technology, and uh, economics, actually, of astronomy, we're all able to do much better than that. Uh, and, that and actually, those economics and the technology actually plays partly into the story, because it's not just amateurs who have benefited from the technology. So uh, I'm a member of the Fox Valley Astronomical Society, which was founded in the Fox Valley in 1944. And I'm also a member of the Northwest Suburban Astronomers and sort of a member ex officio of the uh, Grand Rapids Astronomical Association. Uh, my home state is Michigan, Detroit area. Okay, so what is dark matter? Or is it matter at all? Well, the answer is we really don't know. In fact, part of the motivation for this talk was a, a very good talk given by Don Lincoln of Fermi Lab, who actually came right out and said that if you look at all, all the information we have, we really don't know what dark matter is. All we know is that we see artifacts or effects that are associated with gravity in our normal experience in our current theories. But we really don't know what it is. Uh, and part of the purpose of this talk is to actually get it down to the point of, to try to get it to the point of it being comprehensible that these effects are what we normally associate with gravity and they're not that complicated to figure out. Now, some of the things you can do with it get very complicated when you start getting into cosmology and all that. But the basic question of how you determine there is this of these effects that we attribute to matter and gravity uh, is actually fairly simple and it has a long history. 
the reason it's come up so much recently, of course, is because of improvements in sensor technology. And of course, ultimately, not only do we not understand gravity on the cosmological scale, that's my personal opinion, we don't understand matter on the quantum mechanical scale with regards to gravity. There is still no theory that, that unites quantum mechanics and gravity. So what actually is observed that makes people think there is this material called dark matter or there are these effects that we normally associate with matter? Well, one of the, one of the most complicated and most, I guess sexy is the only word to use or the most remarkable is the uh, appearance of uh, galaxy cluster collisions and enhanced X-rays emissions. But more fundamental is the fact that we can actually do what is called gravitational lensing, which I'll briefly describe. And in fact, that can be described totally with high school mathematics. Once you know general relativity, once you know that, the rest of it's high school mathematics. The other place where these effects come up is the anomalous rotation of galaxies. Basically, galaxies rotate faster than they should based on the observable matter. And then related to that is inside of galaxies, clusters, inside clusters of galaxies, the galaxies are moving much faster than they should if they were only being bound by normal matter. And basically recognizing this problem requires only high school mathematics and a little bit of physics. So let's start with the most complicated situation because it raises all the issues that, that we trickle down into. Uh, we see these, you've probably seen this picture before. It's called the bullet cluster. The uh, cluster on the right is called the bullet cluster. Uh, the other one doesn't seem to have a name. It looks like a wall, but these are two galaxy clusters that have passed through each other. And the interstellar matter is mixing up with the visible galaxies and the dark matter. And the blue signifies the dark matter. The pink represents interstellar matter as imaged in X-rays. So that's directly observed. And the, of course, Hubble telescope image of the actual visual and near infrared. But the blue is inferred. It's important to realize that. So like I said, the actual stuff that we recognize as galaxies and stars uh, are, is actual visual image from the hot space, Hubble Space Telescope. So you could take this picture yourself if you had a big enough telescope out in a dark site. The X-rays are actually observed. They're in the two to 10 kilovolt region. Uh, that's a direct observation. And it's believed to be mostly associated with hot interstellar gas or the interstellar media as it's known, ISM. The blue is inferred by looking at things like gravitational lensing. So that's an inference. And so what it really represents is the equivalent amount of mass that would cause the distortion of the light coming from galaxies behind the cluster. And we'll talk about how that's done. And what's interesting, if you go, if you go on the web and you can find actually some of these articles and I'll put them in the references, they're in the references. If you read these articles, even if you don't understand everything in it, you get a flavor of it that First of all, some of, these, some of this work is done by groups of 30 people spread around the world. There are many simulations and many models and many approximations and assumptions. So while this may be the most visually interesting representation of dark matter, it's actually the one that personally I view is the least reliable, maybe isn't quite fair to the workers in the area, but it's the one that I would actually put the less, least weight on because it involves so many models and simulations. Uh, I used to work in a business where we did lots and lots of simulations and the, the key issue with any simulation is how do you validate it? Well, that's very difficult to do when the stuff's all a couple hundred light, a couple hundred million light years away or further. And here's a counter example. Oh yes, I, I need to back up here. Uh, this cluster, if you believe the simulations and models, you can explain it. You can explain the fact that the galaxy cluster, the interstellar matter, and the dark matter all separate. The two have passed through each other and now they're separating and, they, and it all sticks together. Here's this mass of dark matter with this galaxy cluster and here's the associated inter interstellar media. Over here is the other group of dark matter with the interstellar media lagging, which you might expect it to lag um, with the uh, galaxy cluster going in the other direction. But there's counter examples. 
And one of them is the cluster, the, the uh, fourfold galaxy cluster collision, ABO 520. Uh, I put down the right ascension and declination. Um, it's four hours uh, east of the uh, vernal equinox, and it's right near the uh, celestial equator from here on Earth. Uh, it's actually composed of images from multiple sources as well. Uh, the, the Canadian French Hawaii telescope is used for some of the visual observations. The wide field planetary camera of the Hubble Space Telescope is used for another group of them. Uh, the Chandra X-ray telescope is actually used. And this is actually, I correct myself, three galaxy clusters that have passed through each other. And again, you see the um, visual traces. Uh, in this case, unfortunately, they've changed the color code. So the, the X-rays are green and the uh, blue represents again the inferred um, dark matter or excessive gravitational lensing if you wish because that's what it really is this is represents gravitational lensing so how was this picture created first of all using the the canadian french hawaii telescope and averaging over it they get a luminosity map then they take the visual space telescope image as is and that was part of, that was shown in the composite and then they also use the Hubble Space Telescope image to look through the image and look for gravitational lensing for galaxies and quasars that are behind the cluster. So uh, gravitational lensing is how this is determined. So it's a computation, it's based on assumption. And finally, the Chandra X-ray telescope produces the X-rays. But if you look at it, the X-rays hang the X-rays, which are believed to come from the interstellar media, are sort of sitting in the middle. The, uh, dark, the dark matter or the gravitational lensing effects are seen across the entire field. The, two, the galaxy clusters are separated in space. There's a void in the middle. And that's represented in the luminosity map produced by the Canadian French Hawaii telescope. So the question is asked, why are the X-rays hanging around? Why is the ISM hanging in the middle when the, when the dark matter is spread out on the two sides and the galaxy clusters are going their merry way? So this one actually defies the computations, the same computations that are used to, val to uh, produce the simulation for the, for the um, bullet cluster. So here's my personal take on it. First of all, this is a very complicated problem. The people working on it work very hard. They use multiple techniques. But that very fact to me makes it less reliable. Um, and we have under a dozen examples of this and it's not consistent. The bullet cluster behaves differently than the ABL, than, than ABL 520 does. And again, all of the dark matter estimates are based on lensing. So let's talk about lensing. Well, gravitational lensing, as many of you probably know, was actually first verified in eclipse expeditions in the 1910s. Uh, and basically there, what they looked at was the fact that light from stars that was right at the edge of the sun during an eclipse was bent and they could measure the bending. In fact, Frank Ross, who was uh, one of the astronomers up at, um, up at Yerkes, who was a chemist by training, actually did a lot of work being a chemist on how to control the distortion in photographic emulsions, which was what they used at the time. Interestingly enough, gravitational lensing was first suggested by the astronomer John Mitchell in 1784. And it was first computed by a German self-trained mathematician called Soldner in 1801. And basically his, he treated light corpuscles because this is before the wave theory became popular. Remember back in the old days after Newton, it was the corpuscular theory of light. So he just said, Mitchell and Soldner just said, well, they have mass. They might be moving very fast. And then, of course, they knew how fast they'd move because prior to this, Ole Romer, the Danish astronomer, had measured the speed of light. So that had been known for 300, for almost 50 years at this point. So they basically treated them as sun grazing comets. And they computed a deflection, which turns out to be about half of the uh, one you get from general relativity, but they computed a deflection. So even back then, people were suspicious that you could actually see this. Of course, the technology was nowhere near good enough in 1801 to do this. 
and they knew it was going to be very small, like 0.8 arc seconds, which is a very small number, of course. So how do we use it today? Well, today it's used to try to estimate the mass or the distribution of mass of an intermediate object. This is the object here in the middle is called the lensing object. Behind it is the blue galaxy, which is very distant. Uh, it's often a quasar, in fact. And then we're sitting here as the observers here on Earth. And so the ray of light would leave the galaxy in the background. And it would, if, it, if this had zero mass in here, the ray of light would just go straight out this way. But since this has a significant amount of mass, it actually can bend this. Now, this is greatly exaggerated because a typical bending is of the order of arc seconds or maybe a few arc minutes. So it's a very small portion of a degree. So this is exaggerated, of course, for purposes of illustration. So the ray, the ray, the ray that would normally be sent out here is sent here. The nor ray that would normally go here, if they're perfectly lined up, would go here. And we would actually see two or four or even a ring distributed around this object that actually represented the object behind it. Interestingly enough, this possibility was suggested in 1937 by Fritz Zwicky, but the technology wasn't good enough. It took until the 70s and 80s before the sensor technology was good enough to do this. They had plenty of big telescopes in the 30s. They just didn't have the electronics technology, which of course was all based on physics known in 1924. It just took multiple generations of technological development to actually get us to the point where we could uh, build CCDs and detectors that are good enough for it. So, so if somebody goes and takes their junior course in uh, calculus of several variables and then takes a one semester course in tensor calculus, they will learn how to calculate this following simple formula. The angle of the deflection, the angle of the deflection will be equal to a constant times the mass of the lensing object divided by the radius of the lensing object. And that's it. Multiplication by a constant and division by, a con by the radius. Okay, now the angle of course is what we measure and it's measured in radians, not arc seconds because arc seconds are, are you know, an artifact from the Babylonians. Uh, radians are the natural geometrical measure. As most astrophotographers will tell you, there's 205,000 and change arc seconds in a radian. So again, you measure, it, you measure it in arc seconds or pixels and you convert it to radians. So that's a, a simple direct conversion. Okay, so what is this constant K? Well, this constant K would have been known to Isaac Newton and Ole Romer 300 years, almost 300 years ago. It's four times the gravitational constant divided by C squared. So this is one of the, I, I, I view this as one of the miracles of science that someone could actually make fundamental measurements 300 some odd years ago when Newton and then Cavendish came later lived and make these precise measurements of the gravitational constant in their laboratories with, with torsion balances. And then Ole Romer could look at the satellites of Jupiter and see when the eclipse timing changed when we were on opposite sides of the sun from Jupiter. And they could come up with these constants that we need today to calculate the gravitational bending of light using Einstein's theory, which was developed in the 20s, in the teens, excuse me. Okay, well, it turns out this constant is three times 10 to the minus 27, which is part of why your, these bending effects are so subtle. That's a small number. Now there's one little subtle point here. Uh, the effect of the lens, the distance between the lensed object and the lens, just like in normal optics, can affect how much the deflection angle is seen. So for example, here you, this is what that previous uh, slide showed. Here it showed basically the, uh, the lensing object, the galaxy cluster that's the lensing object being halfway between the two. That almost never happens. Usually, the imaged object or the lensed object is like 10 or 20 times further. It's you know, probably usually a quasar and it's a billion years, a billion light years away. And this one's only a few hundred million at most. So you might have to make an adjustment of roughly a factor of two. 
This, by the way, is the situation with an eclipse of the sun. The star is essentially infinitely far away compared to the sun and the earth. In the case of a, of a foreground galaxy that's a few hundred million light years away, the lensed object might be five giga years away and be a quasar. So it's gonna be very, very far away. So this is actually more representative of the real situation. But if, if it's close, you have to compensate for it, but we know how to do that. This is basically obeys the same law as the, um, as the, as the, as the thin lens formula that everyone learns. Okay, so let's get back to the story. We measure this angle and we might, we measure the angle, convert it to radians. Uh, we might have to correct for the fact that the, the object in the background is fairly close, but usually it's gonna be far away. So usually it's direct measurement. And so now we need to find M and R or given R, we need to find M and given M, we need to find R. Well, we don't know the mass. In fact, that's the whole point of the exercise. So here's where your high school algebra comes in, my friends. This is the purpose for the talk. You solve this equation for M. Well, this is barely even, this is probably junior high. So now that I think about it, it's junior high algebra. So you solve this equation for M, you multiply by R on, the, on both sides and you get that the mass is equal to the angle in radians times the radius of the cluster, the lensing cluster, the radius of the lens divided by the constant, which was something 10 to the minus 27 and change. But usually we know the distance, the radius of the lensed object because it's a galaxy that, or a cluster of galaxies that we can use Hubble's law and get the distance. So the radius is just the angle times the distance, thanks to the redshift. This assumes, of course, the lensing object is visible. It isn't always, in which case it's a little harder. So the net result, when we plug this formula for R, angle times distance, and plug it in there, we get that the mass is the angle squared times the distance to the, op, to the, lens, to the lens, divided by this constant. So let's do an example. One that you've probably seen a million times is so-called Einstein cross. It's in the constellation of, Pre of Pegasus. The lensing galaxy is 400 million light years away. So it's fairly close. We have to convert that to meters. And this was one of the problems when you deal in physics, right? They're always changing units on you. So you got to dig out your hand. You either got to go on Google and ask it, how do you convert, you know, furlongs to per fortnight to miles per hour, or you got to convert light years to meters or parsecs or whatever. So 400 million light years turns out to be roughly four times 10 to the 24th meters. The cross is actually 1.6 arc seconds across, which turns out to be 7.8 times 10 to the minus six radians. That's a division. You take this number 1.6 and you divide by 200,000, 205,000 and change. And that's where this number comes from. Of course, the actual angle of the deflection is half that. So the radius of this object, of this, of this lens is half this number times the distance in light years. So there's no algebra, that's a calculation. You multiply, the, you multiply the angle in radians times the distance. That's actually the definition of radians, of course. And you get the uh, radius. So the radius is fairly small. It's only 1600 light years. Or in units that we can actually do something with, 4.4, 1.47 times 10 to the 19th meters. Again, you can, go on, you can go on Google and find the converter to convert one to the other. So there's no mystery there in case you don't happen to remember the constant. So what's the mass? Well, it's gonna be the angle squared times the distance divided by the three times 10 to the minus 27. Again, this is four times G divided by C squared. Numbers that have been known for 300 years. And up pops 1.9, basically two, times 10 to the 40th kilograms, which is a small fraction of the mass of the Galky Way. So this is probably not dark matter. In fact, what it actually is, is the core of a galaxy. The actual galaxy is almost an arc minute across. So the, the actual galaxy that, we're, that this is caused by is actually, actually bigger than the field of view of this box. We're actually seeing a lensing fortuitously caused by a quasar out at 4 billion light years away. And this galaxy's core just happens to line up. Now, given the billions of galaxies there are, something like this is bound to happen. And of course, given our techniques with survey telescopes, now we can find it. Okay, so let's summarize lensing as a tool. 
to, to use it, you have to detect the lensing effect in an image. You have to measure the angular deflection of the light. Now that's easy with a cross. Now, if you've got an arc, which many of these lensing effects produce arcs, it's a little bit harder, but not much. You basically take the tangent points at multiple points of the arc and see where they cross. And that tells you the radius. You have to measure and infer the distance to the object that's being lens, that's doing the lensing, which is the mass you're trying to estimate. You have to measure or infer the distance of the object that is being lensed, the object that's much farther away from you that's actually being it's the light is actually being distorted by the lensing object. And you have to adjust the angle of, as required. That maybe is a factor of two, usually it's not. Usually it's pretty close to the same number. And then, then for, once you've done all that, the mass of the lensing object is the angle squared, again in radians, times that distance divided by the constant K. And that's it. You're done. And by the way, as I remarked before, this was actually proposed as a technique to estimate the mass of clusters of galaxies in 1937. The problem is, is their technology wasn't good enough at the time. And of course, it was done by none other than Fritz Zwicky, who some of you may have heard of. Uh, he was a Swiss astronomer who worked in the 30s and 40s at Mount, at, uh, Mount Palomar and Mount, uh, and like a, Mount Wilson. And uh, he is the first person to actually observe that there were problems with the gravity of galaxies and galaxy clusters. And as I said, the problem was the, the, it wasn't up to it. He published a very nice note, which appeared in physical review letters. You can go find it on the internet. It's one page long. It's almost entirely written in plain English. No tensor calculus required. Okay, so that's the first, that's the effect that we use very often to determine uh, the distribution of dark matter in space. And we will finish up the talk with the, one of the most recent usages of that technique. Other ways in which we know that dark matter or that there are effects that we attribute to something called dark matter is the anomalous rotation of galaxies. This was first observed in 1939 in the galaxy M31. Now more recent people have reconfirmed it and done a better job. And for some reason I don't understand, they're the ones you always hear about. You never hear about the person who did it first and raised this whole issue that there was something wrong with the way galaxies are rotating. And what he did is he looked at M31 and they plotted the spectra and looked at the redshift of stars in the core and the emission nebula of the spiral arms. He used film because this was 1939 and the Crosley 36, 36 inch reflector at Lick Observatory. The exposures had to be tens of hours uh, and were guided by eyeball and hand. There was no auto guiders, there was none of that. And the core alone required 23 plates from taken from August 8th, 1937 to August to September 29, 1938. So it took almost a year just to do the core, which is where the bulk of the data comes from, you'll see in a moment. And uh, in what's nice about his paper, you can actually find it on the internet and I'll give the, the reference. Um, his paper actually um, gives the individual information about the individual plates, how long it was taken, what days, how many hours. So you can get a real sense of it. You don't have to go and dig up a database to find it. This work was done with a telescope actually built in 1879 by the amateur astronomer, uh, Andrew Ansley Common. He was one of the earliest astrophotographers. And in fact, he was awarded a Royal Astronomical Society's gold medal in, 19, in 1884. The telescope was then sold to Edward Crosley for whom it's named today in 1885. And the reason is, are you ready for it? Common had aperture fever. He wanted to build a bigger one. So he needed the cash. Uh, Crosley moved it to Halifax in the UK. Uh, didn't do too much with it that I've been able to find. And then he donated it to Lick Observatory in 1896. You got to remember back then, all telescopes moved to California. Now they all go to Hawaii, they go to La Serena in Chile, or they go into space. But back then, all good telescopes went to California. It required extensive refurbishment and it wasn't put back into service until 1905. In fact, the then director, uh, Professor Hussey, 
sir, that's his name, Hussey, uh, actually characterized it as a pile of junk when it arrived at the Lick. But given shipping, you know, anything can happen. A few words about a Andrew Ansley Common. He was born in Newcastle on Tyne. His father was one of the originators of cataract surgery. He actually worked as a sanitary engineer, which was a big deal at the turn of the century, well, in the middle of the century. Um, disease was rampant. They didn't understand sanitation. So, you know, sanitary engineering then was a big deal. It, it improved the health of London immeasurably. And he operated, before he built the 36 inch, he operated a 17 inch in his London garden. He bought the 36 inch mirror from Calver. He tried to make his own 18 inch mirror, I believe, and it was not successful. So he actually went to the firm of Calver who uh, made the 36 inch for him. You must remember, this is before we were aluminizing mirrors. This is the days of silvering mirrors with chemical processes. And in 1885, he started work on a 60 inch, which unfortunately he didn't finish, uh, but he ended up donating it to Harvard and it went to their South African observatory. So it, it got used and he died in 1903. And by the way, this picture of the, uh, of the Orion Nebula, that's what got him the Royal Astronomical Society's gold medal in 1884. So in 1905, the 36 inch was put back into commission uh, James Keeler, who became the uh, observatory director in 1898, uh, they spent seven years putting it back into, into operation. Uh, he moved the, the plate position from the Newtonian focus to the prime focus, sort of anticipating what would later happen with the 120 and 200 inches. Uh, improved the clock drive and built it to the best 19th century uh, boilerplate standards. This instrument remained large, with improvements, of course, this instrument remained in service until 2009. We should all have as a productive career. And the American Astronomical Society gave Keeler a award in 1905 for his picture of the, of the Orion Nebula. But let's fast forward to 1939 and Babcock and his studies using this very same instrument. So here's our subject for the Nebula. Uh, it's about three degrees and change across in the uh, in common measurements. Of course, there's halos that you'll see in radio telescopes and other instruments, but it's about three degrees or about 200 minutes of arc across. Uh, this is an image, unfortunately, that, that appeared in the original paper, but it's probably been uh, photocopied and scanned so many times it's been degraded. This actually shows the galaxy and these little circles represent some of the emission nebula in the outer parts of the nebula. Uh, this is actually the range of velocities starting from the, the leading part of the, of the galaxy coming towards us, excuse me, going away from us. And this is the galaxy going towards us. So this is actually the center of the galaxy. This part of the galaxy is rotating towards us. So it has a blue shift. So it has a higher velocity. And this part of the galaxy is going away from us. And you probably, you may not be able to read the scale, but the scale here is in kilometers per second. And so at the low, at the, at the, at the end of going away from us, the red shift is negative 700. And at the end of the, at the other end of the galaxy going towards us, it's plus 700. And this is all relative to the average, of course, to the average red shift. These dots in here all represent the points taken with the, um, with the core of stellar spectra. And these represent the emission nebulas. You see, it's almost a, a straight line. It's almost, but not quite a straight line. There's a little dip on each side caused by the void in between the, uh, in the galaxy, between the core and the bulge and the spiral arms. By the way, uh, some of these measurements were actually taken, some of the brighter parts were actually taken with a six inch reflector, but most of it was with the 36. Okay, so what is the rotation rate of, a, how can we, how do we compare this? I mean, this is, this is the observation. What can we infer from this? Is it reasonable? Well, ever since Newton, we've known how to do this. The centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. And I'm not gonna get in the high school discussion about centripetal, about centrifugal force and all that. It's the centripetal acceleration that keeps an object in orbit. And it's gonna be equal to the gravitational acceleration pulling it inwards. 
So let's look at a real simple case. Let's look at the case of a spherical galaxy. Now I know that's not what Andromeda is, but let's do a simple case because I can do it with high school algebra and live up to my advertising. And let's assume the density is symmetrical and the object's orbit is circular. So this isn't a galaxy, of course, it's the Earth. And this is the shows an object in a circular orbit around the Earth, which you probably a geostationary satellite or nearly. Uh, the acceleration vector, of course, points towards the Earth because that's the way the gravity pulls. And the velocity vector, which is what Babcock was measuring, uh, is going tangential per, uh, perpendicular to the acceleration. And the velocity that's observed, which will be the Doppler shift, going towards you or away from you will be V squared divided by the radius of the orbit. And that will equal the gravitational field at that point in space. Well, if you're outside the, the mass of the object, if you're outside the mass of the object you're, you're orbiting, you know what it is. Newton knew what it was. It's the gravitational constant times the mass of the central object divided by the radius squared. So again, we can now invoke high school mathematics, multiply both sides by little r, and take the square root. And we get that the velocity will be the gravitational constant known since the time of Newton and Cavendish times the mass divided by the radius. And you take the square root of the whole thing. Notice that the radius is in the denominator, which means if you're outside the galaxy and you move further away, the velocity will decrease. And in fact, this is called Kepler's rule law. Okay, what happens if you're inside the, the spherical galaxy? Well, it's a little more complicated, but not much. Uh, I apologize for the graphic, but I didn't know any better way to do it. Here's the radius of the galaxy, the spherical galaxy. Here's the point, the circle, the sphere on which we're trying to figure out what the gravitational pull is. This is where we're going to calculate little g over r. Well, if this thing is symmetrical, it turns out that this point feels no gravitational influence from any of the mass outside it. And the answer to the reason for that is fairly simple. Imagine that you take this entire shell from this, from the radius of the orbit out to the outer part of the galaxy and turn it into a whole series of little thin shells. At each of those shells, I can then look in any direction. Let's take this direction here along the horizontal. It could, could, could go here, it could go here, but let's do the horizontal. And I notice that this distance here is about one third of this distance. That means this area here, it's, it looks like a line, but it's actually an area. The area here will be nine times what the area is here by similar triangles. Okay. I, you needed to do a little bit of elementary school geometry there. So the area here will be nine times the area there. So that means every ounce of matter here, pardon me, there will be nine times as many ounces of matter here or grams of matter here as there are over here. But gravity goes like one over R squared. So the, the, the matter here per gram has nine times as much influence on this point as this does. So they cancel. There's nine times more matter here than there is here, but per gram, there's nine times more gravitational force for this matter than there is for this matter. So I hope that's clear. This is sometimes known or it's overly dignified as being Newton's shell theorem. Uh, and it could be shown with calculus and other techniques, but it's actually fairly obvious geometrically. Newton would probably be embarrassed if you told him it was his theorem. So the bottom line is that this point feels no gravitational force from any of the matter outside its own orbit. And how much mass is inside the orbit? Well, if the if the uh, if the mass is constant, if the density is constant in inside the entire sphere, it's just going to go like the cube because the volume of the sphere is is a cube. So we just plop that in for g. And so here's the final result you get for a spherical galaxy. If you're outside the galaxy, the velocity will go down as one over the square root of r. If you're inside the galaxy, when you do a little algebra, here's, mar here's the mass that's inside the sphere of radius little r. We divide by r and we take the square root. 
Well, you do, again, a little high school algebra, and you find out it's linear. So inside the galaxy, the velocity ought to go linearly, and outside the galaxy, it ought to go down. But again, this is for a spherical galaxy, and Andromeda is not a spherical galaxy. But in both, in both cases, notice, again, the velocity is the radius of the orbit times the gravitational influence at the distance of the orbit, and you take the square root. So here's a simplified model of Andromeda. It's got a core and it's got a disk. And if you do this calculation in Excel with that simple simplified model, you end up getting a curve like this. You get that linear portion inside the core. And then when you go outside the core, you get the slowly decaying region with a slight increase. Nothing like Babcock got. Babcock got a linear increase in the outer regions which implied there's a whole lot more mass in there's that imp the fact that he got a linear increase in this region is means that there's a whole lot more mass in there than you can see with your telescope. So this was one of the very early uh, indications there was something rotten, that there was mass out there in the galaxy of Andromeda that was not showing up. And it's a significant factor. It's a significant factor. Well, of course, there's limitations in this simplified model. So the next logical step to do this is to compute the gravitational influence acceleration G, G of R, and take, say there's a core that's a dense sphere, have a bulge, and then have a disk of uniform density. But if we're gonna go to all this trouble, why not use data from real galaxies? Okay, how do you do it? Well, again, V squared over R is the, the, the uh, the centripetal acceleration is going to be exactly equal to the gravitational acceleration. In the case of the, uh, in the case of a sphere, this was easy to do. We just did it. In general, as we said before, v is going to equal r times gr and then a square root. So for real galaxies, using the digital Sloan, uh, the digital the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, in 2006, Poland and Trujillo actually produced these plots of the distribution of luminous matter. And uh, these are log plots. So this is actually represents an exponential decrease. Uh, they found various shapes. There's a, a pure, almost a disk that just basically goes purely exponential. Again, this is a log plot. There's cases in which the center is more concentrated. In this case, the center is more concentrated for NGC 5300. And so it it's basically looks like two pieces. When you're near the central part, there's one exponential and then it splices into another. Uh, Baird spirals look similar. They have a denser core to begin with, which you'd have to accommodate separately. And then here's another disc-like type that consists of two slightly different exponentials. So you can take those, shove them into an Excel spreadsheet, do a little bit of calculations in Excel or higher or plot it all on a curve and hire a, bunch of un hire a bunch of high school students to calculate it out for you. In fact, before we had computers, that's what computers were uh, human beings. And you can calculate that function G of R. And using second year calculus, okay, not just high school math, you can do that calculation and you get this distribution for the velocities. Now, if you wanna see how this is done, and if you know the Python programming language, Pro Professor Bovier, at uh, University of Toronto has all this at his GitHub site. For those of you who deal in software, you know what GitHub is. But th and this is done in the Python programming language. But again, notice, it's nothing like what Babcock served. So what that means, since this curve was derived from this kind of data, which is visible, visible either in optical pardon me, either in visual, infrared, UV, or radio is where this kind of data comes from. So obviously there's something wrong. And of course, the thing that's wrong is what's referred to as dark matter. And in 1939, Babcock remarked on this. He didn't call it dark matter. He simply said, there's mass, there must be mass in and around the galaxy, probably in a halo that we're not seeing for one reason or another. And it's off by a factor of four to 10. Okay, so now let's go back to the very first, the very first observation of the so-called missing mass problem, which is now called the dark matter problem. 
Fritz Zwicky in 1933 did a study of galaxy clusters and he was working with Hubble at the time, by the way, Edwin Hubble. And so he was doing studies of, of, the, uh, of the coma cluster, which you can go look at the, some of the galaxies in it with your telescope. I mean, it's part of the, um, part of the, it's in the area of the Messier hunt. And he made a number of observations in this 1933 paper, which is all of 17 pages long. Nowhere in it does it occur, does any mathematics occur that's beyond, excuse me, beyond a first year calculus class and probably none of it's really beyond a high school algebra class if you paid attention. So here's the key observations. First of all, there's 800 galaxies and the velocities relative to the center of mass of the galaxy range around 1500 to 2000 kilometers per second. Okay, that's a fact. You basically take the entire galaxy cluster, you average all the, the red shifts, some of which are red, some of which are blue, and you get the velocity of the uh, center of mass of the cluster because that's all, all the galaxies are moving. And then you look at the difference between that center of mass motion and the individual measurements you made. So you take an average of the velocities and you subtract off the average from each of the individual ones. And you get this kind of range, 1500 to 2000 kilometers per second. At the time, they thought galaxies were, in the, were of the order of 10 to the 39th or 10 to the 40th kilograms was in a galaxy. And that was based just on stars and interstellar matter as they knew it at the time. Remember, this precedes most radio astronomy. So the neutral hydrogen measurements weren't made. You know, none of that was in there. So this number you know, was probably off easily by a factor of two compared to matter, regular matter. And the cluster radius, well, they knew the, the velocity of the, uh, the recession velocity of the core of the uh, center of mass of the cluster. Hubble tells them how to calculate the distance. So they know the distance. They know the radius in, uh, rate in arc seconds or arc minutes or arc or degrees. And so they can calculate the radius. And so the radius was 10 to the 22nd meters. So these are all just direct observations. The only inference of course, is you're using the Hubble ball. And now here's where Zwicky pulls the rabbit out of his hat. He's trained as a classical scientist. So he knows the virile of Clausius. Now Clausius was trying to do thermodynamics in the 19th century. And uh, he was one of the first people who actually did serious thermodynamics. And he produced what's called the virile theorem. And you can imagine the sophomoric jokes that that made when we were in physics when I was younger. And his theorem basically says the total kinetic energy and the total potential energy of a system in equilibrium will obey the following law. The total kinetic energy is equal to negative one half the potential energy. Now remember, uh, the energy of a, the potential energy of a gravitational system is going to be negative. So that will take care of the negative side. So how do you calculate this? Well, again, this is not anything beyond regular arithmetic and maybe high school algebra. You look at all the different galaxies around their center of mass, and you take their velocities and you square them, multiply them by the mass of the individual galaxy, and you divide by two. And you add them up. There's 800 of them. What's interesting is if you basically assume, if you basically compute an average mass for the, for the galaxies and then multiply the average mass times 800, you'll just get the total mass of the cluster. So it'll basically be, T is basically gonna be the total mass of the cluster times the average velocity squared divided by two. The potential energies are just gonna be the mass of individual galaxies. So galaxy I times galaxy J divided by the distance between them. That's gonna be the gravitational potential energy. And then there's a minus sign of course, because it's an attractive force. Now this is a little bit harder to imagine Professor Zwicky doing unless he had a lot of undergraduates to help him because there are 800 ways to pick the first galaxy and there's gonna be 799 ways to pick the second. So there's going to be whatever that number is, it's uh, gonna be in the um, hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands. So you're not gonna do that at the drop of a hat. You're certainly not gonna do it before you had Excel or some other program language. So what Zwicky said, well, look, this is gonna be 800 times the mass of a typical galaxy and 799, which is essentially 800 times the mass of a typical galaxy. So it's just gonna be the mass of the whole cluster squared. 
divided by some, some average distance. And so since there were 800 galaxies and there were no computers in 1933 that he could work with, you know, von Neumann and the people at, uh, at Los Alamos had not been to Princeton and, uh, and Iowa State and the other people who take credit for develop, inventing the computer, uh, they had not built computers yet that could do this. So Zwicky just used average values for velocity and a uniform spherical distribution of galaxies. The cluster radius was a direct, was a measurement based on the Hubble law distance. So that was pretty straightforward. The total visible mass was estimated to be 1.6 times 10 to the 42nd. That's 800 times the, the mass of the average galaxy as it was known at the time. And so you get the potential energy is negative 0.6 times G times the mass squared. Because remember, there's 800 ways to pick the first galaxy, 799 to pick the second, and they're, both their masses are in there. So it's basically gonna be the total mass of the cluster squared divided by the radius of the cluster. And so if you compute that based on the assumption that this is the mass, because this number here is well known. So the only real assumption is what the mass is. You come up with 10 to the, 10 to the 52nd kilograms meter squared. I've just repeated it here. So what's gonna be the velocity? Well, this would predict, since the, potent, since the kinetic energy is 800 galaxies times one half, the mass of an individual galaxy, notice again, 800 times the mass of the galaxy, typical galaxy, this is gonna be the cluster, times V average, the average velocity squared. So that just becomes that. And remember the Viral of Clausius uh, basically says that for a system in equilibrium, the kinetic energy is gonna be negative one half the potential. And we solve for V. Well, that's easy because we know this number. We just calculated it. It's 10 to the 52nd. So we stick it in and we get that V squared is 6.4 times 10 to the ninth. So you take a square root and you get 80, you get 80 kilometers per second. But the measured number from the redshifts was over a thousand. So you're off by factors of 20 or 30. So let's turn it around. Let's take the velocities that we got and turn it around and solve for the mass. And this is, the, this is your high school uh, algebra exercise to take the formula we used for the velocity and turn it around to get the total mass. And you'll get 5 thirds, 3 fifths flipped over, 5 thirds times the radius, which again is pretty, pretty well known. It's the angle which you could measure directly with your telescope and your eyepiece uh, multiplied by the rate distance computed from uh, by Hubble. The velocities were likewise direct measurements. G has been known for 300 years. And so if we put in a velocity, for example, of a thousand kilometers per second, which is probably a low number, we get that the total mass is 2.5 times 10 to the 42nd. This is over a hundred times what Zwicky estimated and other people estimated looking at what was visible to their instruments at the time. Now it's off by a factor of two or three because they weren't including some of the stuff we now see by radio telescopes, which we would now count. But still, you're off by a factor of, of 50 to 30. And, and so if somebody wants to quibble with this, I'll just quote them a statement by Lord Sherwell, who was the scientific advisor to uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, he once said in regard to a study of uh, some early efforts by Bomber Command, in the Second World War, uh, they were quibbling with how, with with his analysis of their data, and he basically made the following statement: "However inaccurate the figures may be, they are sufficiently striking, and these figures are sufficiently striking. You're off by factors of thirty or a hundred. So there's something else going on here, whether it's dark matter, whether it's some unknown gravitational effect that we don't understand." Whatever it is, there's something else going on here because both in the rota anomalous rotation of galaxies and in the, the, you know, the 1939 work by Babcock as well as the 1933 work by Zwicky on the coma cluster and the 1936 work by Sinclair 
on the Virgo cluster, which came up with similar results, uh, you're off. There's more material there, or there's something about gravity you don't understand. So in summary, I started off by looking at the galaxy cluster mass, evolution, and collisions. It's interesting, but it's very complex, and in, in my personal opinion, prone to error, and it's not fundamental. It's interesting work, and it's important, and I'm glad that people are doing it, but it's not really fundamental because it relies on lensing to get the results. So what really matters to me is the lensing effects. Those allow you to estimate the mass effects. The other observation, and again, the um, lensing effects, it was, known, it was observed in 1937 by Zwicky that this was a very real possibility, but the technology wasn't up to it. The rotation rates of spiral galaxies, again, this has been known since 1939 by uh, from the work by Horace Babcock. It was rediscovered by Rubin and Ford in 1970s. And for some reason, uh, almost all the talks you see uh, act as though they discovered it first and they didn't. In any case, it points to mass that's 10 or more times greater than what's observed. And then finally, the motion within galaxy clusters. This is again, it's been known since 1933. And it points to something that's even more stupendous, something in the range of 50 to 100 times. Okay, references for further reading. So I'm glad you're posting this. Um, all these are available online. And I, I'm sorry if you have to type in these horrifically long URLs to be able to find them. Uh, you can't just, I don't know if you, I don't think you can just cut and paste. Uh, Zwicky's paper, which I think is eminently readable by anyone who's willing to spend a little time reading it and is generally educated, uh, it's available. Or he talks about the coma cluster. Uh, Babcock's paper is even easier to read uh, and it's uh, called Rotation of the Andromeda Galaxy, and it's, it's at Harvard's archives. Uh, if you really want to play around with uh, and try to build your own toy models of galaxy rotation, um, Joe Bove at uh, University of Toronto uh, published a very nice series of lectures on this problem and in, has an entire chapter of his website devoted to it. And again, if you're familiar with GitHub and the Python programming language, you can actually get the source code to do this yourself. So you can do, produce your own galaxy uh, acceleration, gravitational acceleration function, G. Uh, an int a very interesting paper is the, uh, is the paper by, um, I can't read all the names all at once, uh, Lee G. Madavia, Hochstrad, Babel, Dekalanthan, and Kapek on the, uh, on the uh, threefold galaxy collision and the strange results that come out of it, Abel 520. Um, a very interesting survey paper by R. Ellis published by the Royal Society in 2009, it talks about gravitational lensing. So if you really wanna know all the different flavors of gravitational lensing, and there are a lot of them, there's weak lensing, strong lensing, low lensing, micro lensing, that all have different domains in which they operate. Um, it's a very interesting paper to read. And again, it's written mostly intelligible to the layman, and then if you really want to gas, um, at a conference in 2008, 2010, uh, Joel Premick from uh, Santa Cruz, University of California, Santa Cruz, published this uh, PDF. It's basically his presentation. And it's called A Brief History of Dark Matter. Now, it's not brief. It's even longer than my talk. It's 84 pages long. Mine's only 39, which is bad enough, right? But his is 84. Uh, and he finishes it up, and this is why I think you all should go look at it. He finishes it up with a rap song about dark matter. And so I'll just let you look at the first one. I'm not going to try to sing it because I was warned that Facebook might cut it off if, uh, if it thinks it's music. So I'll just let you read it. Zwicky, unfortunately, was a somewhat prickly character, and um, he, he made a lot of enemies, unfortunately including Alan Sandage, who became, uh, who took over from Hubble when Hubble retired. And so he, in a lot of his work, unfortunately, did not get much press. The other reason it didn't get much press at the time was because what can you do with it? You couldn't do many of the observations. You had the coma observations. You had the rotation of the Andromeda galaxy by Babcock six years later. Uh, you had uh, Sinclair's observation of the similar problem with the uh, violation of the varial theorem. Um, 
in the uh, Virgo cluster. So you had all these problems, but the prob- the thing is, is this, the technology wasn't up to do much with it. Even though, like I said, in 37, Zwicky was observing that, hey, look, you could use gravitational lensing in clusters to determine you know, what the missing mass problem was, which is how one way it was known for many, many years. So anyway, so this is, you should all go look at uh, Premix reference here. If you just Google a brief history of dark matter, you'll find it. And so you don't need to type in all this, uh, all this URL stuff. Uh, one of the interesting things, of course, about uh, the history of dark matter, there have been many hypotheses put out by people much, much smarter than I, like Jim Pebbles, uh, about what whether it's cold dark matter, whether it's hot dark matter, uh, how is it distributed, what is it, if it's matter at all, um, other than effects we just don't understand. So that's a very interesting, uh, this, uh, this brief history uh, is, can be somewhat intimidating if you look at it, but it, you can get a flavor of it by looking at the charts. Just in the last week, using the dark energy camera at uh, Sarah Tarola, the dark energy camera was built, of course, in Batavia by Fermilab. They produced this drawing of the patch of the sky they've been looking at thus far, trying to infer dark, dark matter. It's called the dark energy camera, but it's doing a lot of work on, on the dark matter problem. And uh, if you go read the press release from this, uh, Jeffrey's remarks that, in fact, this is actually much smoother than they expected. So there's even more uh, things that are poorly understood. And this is just published in the last week, I believe. So parting thought. And I'll just read this one to you. In the ultimate, in ultimate analysis, everything is incomprehensible. And the whole object of science is simply to reduce the fundamental incomprehensibilities to the smallest possible number. Uh, Thomas Henry Huxley was one of the uh, earlier early acolytes of uh, Charles Darwin. He spent a great deal of time, in addition to his own scientific work in paleontology and geology, uh, spent a lot of time uh, giving public lectures in Great Britain, popularizing the work. So with that, I will finish with a quote of Mark Twain. Uh, I, am, I am tired and you're, uh, you are tired. Or the other quote was, you, the mind can only absorb what the um, derriere can, can, can endure. So I think I've used my time up and uh, I'll take any questions. All right, uh, we just have a couple questions and they're, they're not really math related, they're more uh, maybe theory related. Mm-hmm. Um, what well, is, all theory relies on mathematics, so well, I don't, yeah. Why doesn't uh, dark matter cluster into structures and or shapes the same way similar to normal matter clusters into shapes like galaxies? Well, actually, it does. Um, there's there's a lot of work being done in which they look at the web of dark matter and they find very often along the tendrils of the web of dark matter that's where the that's where the galaxy clusters appear. So it does. There's actually structure to it. Um, are there, I mean, this is all theoretical, obviously, but are there different densities of dark matter? Well, uh, you might at well ask, are there different density? I mean, I, on what scale? On the smallest scale, we don't know, because we don't know if, if dark matter is even deserving of, the, of a noun, which is one of the open questions. I mean, people use the word, they use a word dark matter as though it's material. What we really observe is gravitational effects we don't understand. And the only way that we, in our normal frame of reference, can interpret it is as matter. Now, if you go look at the lensing effects, yes, you will see different densities. And it'll show up in the form of the ratio of the mass divided by the radius, m over, well, actually, actually m over r cubed, right? So yeah, no, you'll see different densities. Absolutely. Because there'll be different degrees of ray bending. For example, in the case of that, it wasn't even dark matter. In the case of the Einstein cross, you're actually seeing the uh, gra- the ray bending by the core, by the probably the black hole or whatever it is at the core of that galaxy. I forget the NGC number. It's it's actually you know like 40 arc seconds across, so you can probably go take a picture of it. You may not, you won't get a picture of the Einstein cross, but people have seen it with 30 inch uh, telescopes visually. 
anyways, the, the density of the material, um, if it is material, uh, shows up in the in the form of the ratio of m over r cubed. And yeah, there there could be various densities, absolutely. But I'm not sure. You know, that's on a macroscopic scale because that's all these measurements do. You know, it's not like we. You know, someone can tell you the density of a nucleus, right? because we know pretty much how big a nucleus is. In the case of these things, we don't really know, is there some really fine grain structure like nuclei that form the dark matter, which we see macroscopically through these effects? Or is it only dispersive? Is it only on the large scale that you see it? We don't know because you know every time we try to build a detector like they just did with, uh, they were looking for solar, solar axions. I think it was a group in Italy. And they initially thought that they were seeing solar axions, which were one of the putative um, particles that could be making up the dark matter problem. And then they finally realized, oh, it's probably excess of xenon in the, uh, you know, in the material that they're trying to make the measurements with. I mean, we've been through this before with neutrinos. When I was a lad, we knew new there had to be something like neutrinos because otherwise the sun would explode. I mean, something had to be carrying away lots of energy without interacting with everything else. And that was one of the, one of the uh, evidences for the neutrino. And it wasn't until, was it the 70s or the 80s that they actually succeeded in detecting neutrinos? So we've been here before. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, but the answer is yes, there could be various, various densities, absolutely. Uh, but so, but, I'm, but all, all we've ever measured is on the macroscopic scale. We've never measured dark matter on the microscopic scale. That's actually the big problem. Um, so while you were talking, the the person that asked the question chimed in again. He said, regarding density, is there smaller areas of dark matter with more gravitational force than others implying density? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's actually, um, let me back up a bit. Am I still sharing? Yeah. Uh, yes, you're sure. Yeah, I mean, if you look at this, there's actually areas that are denser than others. In fact, what's surprising is there's not as much that's it's not the 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 distribution is actually smoother than they thought. But there are various degrees of density here. The brightness of these patches actually, the brightness of these patches indicates the density. What it of course what it really represents is the degree of deflection of the of the light rays. Right, you're inferring density. You're not actually measuring. Yeah, this is, there's actually, yeah, there's, if you, if you interpret this literally as matter, then literally there is variations in the density. Absolutely. And there is certainly clustering. If you, again, there's some work on the evolution of galaxies and galaxy clusters that, uh, again, it's probably got 16 different simulations, none of which you can validate because we don't you know, conduct experiments on that scale in our laboratories. Um, there are, there are simulations in which you actually get a web of dark matter with concentrations and that's where the galaxy clusters occur or vice versa. But anyways, yeah, no, there's, there's, there's absolutely variations and you can see it here. There's not as much as they, there's not as much as they thought, but recognize this is a substantial part of the sky you're looking at here. You know, this is, this oval here represents the entire sky mapped out onto an ellipse. So this is a small portion, maybe one tenth, maybe one fifth of the area of the sky. And if you zoomed in on this, you would see more finer detail. But this is all they've published thus far. They've been working, I forget, what was it, five years ago, three years ago? They moved the camera from Gene from Batavia to, because um, they built it at Fermilab, the dark energy camera, which produced this map. Remember, to produce this map, what they have to do, this is not a direct measurement. They go out there and they image a whole bunch of, you know, take a whole bunch of frames with this, with this extremely wide field of view camera. It's actually got, I forget how many hundreds, but it's got bunches of CCDs tiled across a, fr across a surface. And they read out all that data. And then they have to pump it all into algorithms that detect the lensing events. And then they infer the, the, uh, the, uh, the mass from that or the gravitational effects of what might be mass from that. So this represents a tremendous amount of computational work, probably many more hours of computational work actually than the observations themselves. But it's not a direct measurement. You know, recognize that when you see this kind of picture, it's, it's an inference 
from a valid data, the data is valid, but it's an inference. But it's the best inference we have. And if you zoomed in on this, you would see much finer structure. Okay, another question. Uh, are there dark matter black holes or are they part of the same black holes that regular matter uh, create? That's a good question. And to that, I don't know the answer because black holes have magnetic fields with them. And I don't know if a dark hole, black hole would have, a mag would have the magnetic field lines. I honestly don't know the answer to that. I suspect they'd be different, but there may not, I mean, since we don't know what dark matter is, we don't know if it can form a high enough density to actually form a black hole. So I, I, I don't know, it's possible. Okay, and then uh, do we have a sense if dark matter was around at the beginning of the Big Bang or a product of cosmological evolution? I have no idea. And I don't know if any, I mean, if you go read the pebbles, if you go look at that survey I referred to, uh, that's a big question in this survey here, the uh, brief history of dark matter, the whole question of hot or cold dark matter um, is tied up with that. The original assumption was actually was that dark matter was hot at the beginning of the universe. And now there's the current assumption now is it's cold. So there are the two are tied together, but again, um, I personally don't know the answer. I don't pretend to, and there've been a lot of back and forth on that as to how it evolved in the course of the evolution of the cosmos. Because again, nobody was there. We can't conduct these experiments in our laboratories. So it's, you know. the nice thing about this kind of work is while it's very, very interesting scientifically and intellectually, fortunately, uh, nobody's paycheck, uh, except for a few people, nobody's paycheck or life depends on it. It's, but it is fascinating work. Okay, thank you very much. I think that is all the questions we have. Okay, I hope this wasn't too, uh, I hope I didn't go too far over the top. But part of my message was, is that the fundamentals of this stuff is, you know, what, there are some base, some, some more advanced things you need to, to dig out. But the basics of this are actually much simpler than you might often, might often think from, from the fancy things you see on Nova or on the Discovery Channel, you know, where there's everything is schmazzy dazzy, you know, graphics and everything. The actual, the actual discovery of this, of these effects and the continuing work in these effects on an observational level is actually fairly simple. So I, I, that was my goal in giving this talk. And if I succeeded in that, I'm happy. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, again, if you're watching this on, uh, on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Um, we're going we're gonna to try to keep, keep uh, putting these meetings on, uh, online even once we go back to in-person meetings. So thank you all for joining, and uh, I hope you all have a, a wonderful evening.